Good morning. How are we? Great to see you. Thank you, Pastor Daniel. Um, don't you just love him? Um, um, so we are in a series called Under the Influence. I was talking with a friend up in the hills these days, and uh, he stopped by the house, and we chatted for a while, and he said, man, I was just driving down the road, and I was just, I couldn't get out of my mind. What am I under the influence of? And um, well, he won points with me. Um, because that's my desire for every one of us, is that we would live in such a way that we are constantly asking ourselves, what am I under the influence of? Because you're under the influence of something. Um, hopefully it's Jesus, and more and more it's His Spirit and His Word that you're under the influence of. But a lot of us, we're under the influence of, of debt, and so that drives us. We're constantly thinking about it. For some of us, we're just under the influence of stress. Stress about how many plates we're juggling, how many different things we're trying to spin in order to kind of just keep up with life. So something is dominating your influence, and if it's not Jesus, then there's something that needs to be adjusted or tweaked or modified in your spiritual journey. And so uh, that's what we're all about. We're all about helping you and helping others adjust their spiritual journey so they can be under the influence of Jesus. If you know our mission statement, uh, just say it with me, meeting people where they are and loving them to where Christ wants them to to be. So, right, that presupposes a couple things. We're in all kinds of places in life that are not God's ideal for us. And we as a church, and you as an extension of the church, and that's what you are, you're an extension of Yosemite Church, you're an extension of God's church, wherever you are, wherever you work, wherever you play, wherever you do your study, wherever you, wherever you are in life, you're an extension of us. And God wants, God's assignment for you is the same as us, is to meet the people you're around where they are. And some of them are in a pickle, aren't they? Have you ever been in a pickle? <laughs> it's not a good spot. That's a dill pickle? What kind of pickle is it? Uh, have you ever been in a pickle? You're just in that spot. You're going, oh my gosh, I hate where I am. But the truth is, God wants to do something in you in that space that you can't ignore and you can't run from. You've got to pay attention to in order for him to get you to the place where he wants you to be. So as you talk about that, we uh, are building this whole year what we call a rule of life. And a rule of life is the spiritual habits and disciplines that you do on a daily basis that bring you under the influence of Jesus. So you've got habits, some of them good, some of them bad. Uh, you've got practices, thing you, things you do on a regular basis. Are those things you're doing bringing you under his influence? If they're not, then we're encouraging you, along with the rest of us, build a rule of life. And the basis of that rule of life is the scriptures. Um, which we've been talking about this month. In that, we talk about this great big um, infinity symbol. And the infinity symbol, we've got four things in the upper left-hand corner. What's the first one? What is it? It's explore. And when we talk about, when we talk about building a rule of life that, um, that God wants us to, we're going to talk about that whenever we explore the Scriptures, we're reading them. We're going to read those. So I'm going to reinforce this in a little bit. Uh, so then the next thing, when we explore, we're going to do what? The second thing on the lower, we're going to discover, brings us up to the upper right, rely, and ultimately to the lower left, which is surrender. That's the place God wants you to be. He wants you to be in that place. Anybody know, even just for a short moment, that, that sense of surrender to God? Would you say, yeah, I, I know that, right? I know it. At least for maybe a moment, I know it, right? What if we could live that way throughout our days, throughout our activities? That's kind of our, that's kind of our goal is to get there. And our goal in this current series is really about uh, increasing our commitment and our ability uh, to experience the Bible as a unified story that leads to Jesus by engaging Scripture daily to hear God's voice, to sense His presence that invites us into His story. So um, this little guy right here, my pocket Bible, um, is, um, you know, really a, a dandy. Uh, copied, printed in um, 18, like 1885. It's an oldie but a goodie, Right? Uh, we talked about the history of Scripture a little while ago, uh, last week, and so we're going to kind of pick that up and talk some more about that. Um, two things, two big things. God's Word is for us. God's Word is for us. Just say that with me. God's Word is for us. God's Word is for me. Now, in that, there's a, there's a hermeneutic. Hermeneutics is the way we study the Bible. And if you have bad hermeneutics, you get bad results in the Bible. If I don't have a healthy frame of reference and how I look at Scripture, then I'm going to get the wrong things. If I look at Scripture from a vantage point that is, that is secular, not spiritual, uh, I'm going to end up with 
misunderstanding when I look at the Bible, which is going to yield itself to misinterpretation, and that's going to turn into misapplication. And so the Bible can have, people can subscribe to the Bible and have misunderstanding, misinterpretation, and misapplication. And when that has happened in the church, it's been bad. It's been ugly. It's been, it's created, it's created wars. It's created dissonance. It's created hate groups. And they use the Bible as their their frame of reference, but it's because they have misunderstanding, misinterpretation, and then misapplication. And so if we're going to get this right, we've got to say, how do, what's the right way to look at that book? What's the right frame of reference that I'm looking at? And so through this month, we've been talking about building that right frame of reference. So when I say God's, God's Word is for us, well, that's kind of a, that's part of our hermeneutic. God's Word was not written to you, but it was written for you right? Because there's first recipients. There's first recipients that got it. When Paul wrote to the book of Romans, he wasn't writing to the, to the, to the church in Rome. He was not writing to the church in Merced, although it applies to the church in Merced, but we are second recipients. There was a first recipient. There's a second recipient. So I'm a second recipient to the Word, which means it's, it does speak to me, but it wasn't originally spoken to me. So that's kind of, kind of one of our first kind of hermeneutical frames of reference. So we're going to kind of build on that today a little bit more. Um, so in doing that, look, probably, our, probably one of the key scriptures that, that any, um, in orthodoxy, any, any uh, Bible-believing uh, evangelical is going to say, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 through 17. Great little passage. Look at it with me. There's nothing like the written Word of God for showing us the way to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Um, Every part of Scripture is God-breathed and is useful one way or another, showing me truth, exposing my rebellion, correcting my mistakes, showing me God's truth. Through the Word, we're put together and shaped up for the task God has for us. That's like put it to work, right? That's the Bible put to work because those four things, right? Right? Showing me truth. That's another translation will say teaching, right? Um, exposing my rebellion. Another translation says rebuke me, showing my rebellion. Um, uh, correcting my mistakes. Other translations just say correct. And then training. Other translations, this is training me to go and do God's work, God's way, go God's, God's task. So all the scriptures for that, those four things you and I should be able to employ on a daily basis because it's for me. When my frame of reference is accurate. In the same little book, 2 Timothy chapter 2, the chapter previous, verse 15, he says, um, do your best to present yourself as a workman who correctly handles the word of truth. And so that's what we're saying. We're saying that we can mishandle it and we can correctly handle it. And so we're trying to build an understanding of what kind of frame of reference empowers me, enables me to correctly handle God's word of truth. When I've got the right frame of reference, I recognize that this book, this book is the mind of God, the state of man, the way to salvation, the hope for sinners, the strength and veracity of believers. Uh, This book Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are correct. Its histories are true. Its decisions are immutable. This book, read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be holy. This book has got light to direct you, food to support you, comfort to cheer you. This book is the mind of God. This book is, um, it should fill the memory, it should rule the heart, it should guide the feet. This book, at the center of it, is Christ as its grand subject, our good, its design, God's glory as its fulfillment and ending. This book, read it slowly, frequently, prayerfully. This book, if you follow its precepts, it will lead you to Calvary, to the empty tomb, to the resurrected Christ, to God himself. That's the book. When you know this book, when you have it from the right frame of reference, all of a sudden, it is all those things and more. It's all those things and more. So we want to kind of ingest it. Last week, we talked about several things. Just a really quick review. I, um, I suggested there are some common yet unhelpful frames of reference, some common yet unhelpful ways to look in the Bible. And most of us are guilty of these. It's not a reference book. 
Now, can you use it as a reference book? You can, but it was never designed to be a reference book. That I'm just going to see what it says about marriage, because the problem with that is I can look at every verse about marriage, but if I take it out of the context of what he's saying in the passage, I can miss the accurate view of marriage. And so there's a danger to that if I just use it as a reference book. I'm just kind of, you know, picking and choosing and looking at stuff called proof texting. Uh, there's a danger whenever we look at it and think of it as a children's book. It's not a children's book. Within the first first book of the Bible, there's incest, there's murder, there's um, polygamy. There are, all kind, there are all kinds of things in the first book all by itself. It's like you wouldn't put those at the top of your children's book. Okay, today, kids, we're going to look at murder. <laughs> Page three of the book. It's good, right? The, the wood, there's, it's not a, now, should we? Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying this book is not a good guide in raising children. It is. It's a fabulous guide. It's the best guide. But it wasn't ever written to be a children's book. And so we can misinterpret it. And oftentimes, whenever try, people try to make it a children's book, they dumb down the content. They whitewash the content. And you miss the raw reality that God didn't tell any lies. That God said it straight. That God didn't cover up his people because he wanted us to think they were perfect because they were not. And none of us are either. That's the good news. That's the good news. Someone has said, in fact, um, the Westminster Confession kind of ascribes to the idea that the book, the Bible's not such a book that man would write if he could or could write if he would. In other words, if we were planning it, we would leave that stuff out. We wouldn't say that, oh yeah, that amazing, phenomenal spiritual leader was also a murderer. We'd leave that out. Oh yeah, that amazing, phenomenal spiritual leader was also an adulterer. We would leave that part out. It's not the kind of book we would write But God says, I got nothing to hide. And my people don't have to hide behind some pretense of being something they're not. They can be people in process that God uses broken and flawed people to accomplish his purposes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, because that means means he can use you. He can use you and he can use me in our brokenness. We don't have to wait until we get it all together to start stepping into the place where God's word can begin to revolutionize and form us in the image of Christ for the sake of others. We don't have to wait for that. We can jump into it. We've, we talked about that it's not a collection of moral stories. It's not a self-help book. It's not a scientific manual. It's none of those things. It was never intended to be those things. In contrast, we talked about the fact that it's a library. It's a human and divine partnership. It's a variety of literary genres that I need to read differently, one from another. It is a cross-cultural experience. I wouldn't go anywhere in the world and expect it to match my culture. And so why would I open the pages of the Bible and think it should mesh my culture? It doesn't. It's a cross-cultural experience. And most beautifully, it's a unified story that leads to the person of Jesus Christ. Um, So we've been talking about um, this idea of Lexio Divina, and so I want to give you, uh, this might be in in an infinity symbol up there, or it might just be some bullets. So Here's kind of the thing. I'm going to put this on a card. Tell me if you think you'd, if this would be helpful. I'm going to put this on a card. The first thing you do about whenever you engage the Bible is think about your approach. And your approach, and this is the approach that I try to do, and, and I'm probably successful maybe 90% of the time. Pray before I read. Kind of simple, isn't it? Pray before I read. We, we, in the pace of life, we pick up and read stuff all the time, and we tend to think, oh, i got to read my Bible, so I pick up and read, but I don't stop and pray before I read, and we miss this chance to invite God's Spirit into softening our heart, into preparing us to hear Him speak to us out of the Scriptures, and so pray before we read. And then, this, and then we, I put, you've seen this in a little circle as well as the infinity symbol. We read, we reflect, we respond and we rest. So four things. They correspond to the other parts of the affinity symbol, right? When I read, I explore. When I, when I start reading, I explore uh, the scriptures. Uh, when, I, when I learn to discover, I, re- I get this sense of reflection. That's meditatio. That's meditation. We'll talk about that some today. After meditatio, after I start learning how to meditate on God's word, which God calls us to do, after that, I respond to his word. And that's oratio. It's really the best response is a prayerful response. God, what am I going to do from this? Um, And then the last thing is I surrender. And in surrendering, I learn to rest in God's revealed truth and his word to me. I can receive it for myself. So when we learn to do those things, we can learn to not misunderstand, but understand correctly. Not misinterpret, but interpret accurately. And not misapply, but apply 
accurately. So those, that's kind of our desire. We're going to talk about three things, three major ways the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us to engage God's scriptures, to engage the scriptures. The first one, uh, three of them, meditative literature, it's um, messianic literature, and thirdly, it's wisdom literature. So we're going to look at those three things today. These should probably be dominant ways I look at the scriptures. I look at the scripture and I come to it and I say, how can I meditate on the scriptures? Haggah is the Hebrew word for meditate. The two most dominant texts, the kind of beautiful passages, is one to Joshua. Joshua has just received the baton. Moses passed it to him. Moses dies and says, Joshua, you now, and what was his assignment? What was Joshua's assignment? Remember what he's supposed to do? Take the children of Israel that had been delivered from bondage in Egypt, right? They were slaves for 400 years. Pretty tough road to hoe, I bet, right? And so they bring them out of bondage, out of slavery, and where is he going to take them? Anybody remember? The promised land. Yeah, sounds good, doesn't it? Promised land. (laughs) If someone promised you land, you'd be, okay, wow. Me? Promised me some land? If you lived one place and someone said, I promise you I'll give you some land, just move to Merced. Okay right? Just move to Mariposa, right? If I said, hey, I've got an extra 10 acres, would you like it? Run away. Run away, yeah. It's, just, it's like, okay, promise me some land. Here I go, right? That's kind of the way it was. Joshua, God met Joshua where he was and said, Joshua, I want to take you to where I want you to be, which is in the promised land. So in the Old Testament, those physical things are spiritual metaphors for us. In other words, God's got a place for you. And whenever we talk about that, we say that, you know, what's, what's God's place for us? Where does he want us to be? Well, he wants us to be in a place where we're surrendered, right? Are, are you following me? Right? Where we're surrendered, that's a big part of the place he has for me. And whenever you're in that place, it's a better place, isn't it? So for us, that's more spiritual than it is geographical. In the Old Testament, it was geographical. It was a physical place. For us, it's a spiritual place. It's a place where we're resting in God. We're surrendered to Him. And you can have all kinds of junk going on around you and be surrendered. You know that feeling? That sense? That's a whole different place than being in the middle of junk and being trying to control it, wrestling with it, trying to power your way through it, because it just doesn't work. Because why? You're not trusting God. You're not relying. You're not surrendering. And so he has a place for us. So look at this text in light of kind of meeting Joshua where he is and God wanting to love him to where he wants to be. Listen to the text. Here it is out of the message version. Make sure you carry out the revelation that Moses, right, the guy that passed the baton, commanded you. Every bit of it. Don't get off track, either left or right, so as to make sure you get where you are going. You see him? He's meeting where he's at, but Joshua, I want you to go somewhere. Make sure, make sure, you're, make sure you're holding on to this, Joshua, so you get to where you're, you're going. Ponder and meditate on it. How much, should she, how much should he do this? Day and night, making sure you practice. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice just makes better. Make sure you practice everything written in it, and here's the promise. Then what's going to happen? Then, say it with me, ready, set, go. Then you'll Get where you're going, then you'll succeed. See, just as God promised, just as God wanted to meet Joshua where he was, he wants to meet you where you are, wherever you are. And maybe, maybe you are not out of bondage from your addiction, your, your drinking, or your, the drugs that you use to kind of medicate, or, or the sex that you go to over and over again because you got dissonance in your relationship, and so you want to look at pornography, you think that'll, that'll do it. So you might be in bondage to something, you're not out of, you're not out of bondage yet but God will still meet you there. He met the children of Israel in bondage. He'll meet you in bondage. And he wants to deliver you. And that deliverance isn't a once and done. That deliverance is a journey of multiple steps where this becomes critical and pivotal to the forward movement. And so he says, Joshua, if you want to make forward movement, Joshua, don't neglect this because it's pivotal, Joshua, to you to get where you're going. And what I want you to do with this is I want you to meditate on it day and night. Whoa, that sounds like a lot, doesn't it? I want you to haggah this day and night. Okay, so that's, that's the Joshua text. Let's look at the, uh, the next most prominent text where haggah is used. And this is sprinkled all through the Psalms. It's sprinkled through the prophets in the Old Testament. But these are just kind of the most salient ones. Um, in Psalms 1, 
Psalms 1 is the kickoff of all the Psalms. There's 150 Psalms in the Psalter. The Psalter is kind of this, this song book of the Hebrew people. Right smack dab in the middle of your Bible, the Psalter, 150 Psalms. It's broken into five sections. It was five scrolls originally, and each one of those scrolls had a theme to it. But Psalms 1 kicks off the whole things and says, this Psalm is launching you into a journey. And notice what it says in verse 2. It says, blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. And who, what does he do? Hagaz on his law How often? Day and night. That person, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Say it with me, ready, set, go. Whatever they do prospers. See, just as God wanted to meet them where they were and love them to where he wants them to be, he wants to meet you where you are. Maybe you're recognizing, yeah, I've got some, I got some bondage. Maybe it's just, frankly, I'm in debt. That's my bondage. Or maybe I've got some bitterness in my life, and that's my bondage. I mean, you name your bondage. It's good to name it. It's good to name it because to name it is the first step to get free from it. And then be able to say, God, okay, meet me in this space. And so God wants to invite you into this space. God says, come, come and meditate on my truth, and I'll get you where you're going, and I'll help you to prosper, and I'll help you to succeed. Um. This idea, this concept of Hagah, is, um, it means several different little nuances to it. It means um, to groan, uh, to moan, uh, to growl, uh, to whisper. Wow. What's he saying? So remember, uh, throughout this last month, I've said that whenever we read the Bible, it's, it, it should be for formation, not just for information. Right? So what he's, what he's inviting us into is formative reading, not informational, just get some data so I can do something with it or to find out what's interesting, just to get some information, but it's formational. It's literally in, in Isaiah chapter 31, um, Isaiah uses the word Hagah to describe a lion over its prey. Um, uh, growing on the farm, growing on the farm in Colorado, we had we usually had multiple dogs. Any dog lovers? You know, arr, 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 dog lovers out there? We, we on the farm. You always had like two or three dogs, and so my dog was Missy, uh, and Missy was a sweetheart. She's kind of a um, collie like dog. She's a sweetheart. She's a great dog, unless she had a bone. All right. Anybody ever say I got a bone to pick with you? Anybody ever tell you that? Oh, I've got a bone to pick with you. So if, if Missy had a bone, I knew that just leave Missy alone, right? But at first when she'd get a bone, and on, on the farm you've always got, you know, carcasses somewhere. This is like, really? Yeah, on the farm that I grew up on, this carcass is somewhere. There's an old dead cow uh, out in the, in, the, in the pasture. There's an old dead horse out there. There's a dead antelope somewhere or a dead coyote. And, and Missy would grab, you know, a shank of a, shank of a deer or a shank of an antelope or a, of a cow. And she'd come, this big old bones, and she would kind of just, you know, show it off. <laughs> You know, kind of waving the shank around, you know, okay, I see, you know. And then she would slip away and she would sit under a tree and she would start hagah-ing the bone. And the little trio of larnax, tongue, and teeth would work together to break it into smaller pieces so she could consume it because she knew that bone made her a better dog. She was going to devour that bone. See, Hagah is what God calls us to with his word. Like Isaiah describing in a similar way that lion over its prey, the lion's going to devour that bone. He's going to chew on it, breaking it into small digestible pieces, piece by piece, swallowing it because it'll make him stronger, more lift, more swift, more capable. And that's what it'll do to you. When you choose to Hagah the Word of God, you break it into smaller pieces. Now, someone may have been overwhelmed last week because I talked about reading from start to finish, and you're going, the whole Bible, it's a pretty big pastor. Uh, But then I broke it down and said, no, no, you got to understand. Literarily, we come to it with a frame of reference that says, this is not a book, this is a collection of books. And so when I'm reading to start to finish, I don't have to read from Genesis to Revelation. I can read just Genesis, or just Isaiah, or or just... um, Philippians or just Romans, I could read just one book. 
Or you could go to the Bible Project. Anybody check it out yet? The Bible Project, please check it out. Those guys are rock stars. They are Bible nerds, um, but rock stars also. They've, got, they've put every single book in the Bible into about a four-minute video that will show you front to back of every single book what it's about. Well, why would that be helpful? Because in four minutes, you could read any one of the books in pictorial form, showing you what's the theme, what's the context, right? So whenever I come to the Scriptures and read, I want to read from a frame of reference that says, what's the historical context? What's the, the literary context? Is it uh, narrative? Is it poetry? Is it discourse? Uh, what's the literary discourse? What's the context there? What's the setting, the context of the setting? What's happening in the characters? I can get the frame of reference, and then I can go to my specific bone. I can take a verse or two and just chew on it. Arr, 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 what does that mean? What does that mean? Arr, 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 arr. It's Hagah. And he says, I want you to Hagah. And so literally, the idea of the Hagah is not the big picture. It's the morsel. It's the sentence. It's the paragraph. It's the word. Because in the sentence, in the paragraph sentence, and in the word, I find a, a theme and a pattern, and a continuity, and I start chewing on that, and start saying, wow, there is a dominant, right? We all know this, right? There's one of the most dominant themes, certainly in Jesus, the New Testament literature, is this thing called love, right? But it's, a, but it's an accurate love. It's not a fickle kind of love. It's not a one day up, one day down kind of love. It's not a, it's not a love just the people that are like me kind of love. When I chew on it, I recognize, oh my gosh, this is a persevering love. This is an unconditional love. This is a love your enemy kind of love. <laughs> right? I got to chew on that. I got to chew on that because that means tomorrow I might see somebody I don't like, but God says I'm supposed to love. And that's what I get when all of a sudden I start figuring out that this word of God is just not for me. This word of God has to be in me. And it can be for me. You can go to church and go, this is supposed to be for me. So tell me something that's for me, pastor. And I can tell you stuff that's for you, but until you start digesting it, it won't be in you. You're not going to be translation, tr transformed in your life because I give you something that's truth that's for you. I do that every single week. You'll be transformed and you say, I want to chew on that. I want to digest that. I want it to go from external to internal. I want the internal presence of God to be bolstered by the internal consumption of his word so I have the strength to be able to do whatever he's called me to do, primarily love those that are difficult. So what are you chewing on these days? What are you chewing on? And you know, Hagah also, when Hagah is, Hagah is also, you could, you could Hagah in the negative. So you've heard me say this before, that if anybody ever worry, any good worriers out there, a little anxiety in life, right? Some of you are worriers, guess what you're doing? You're Hagahing. You're going, you know, worrying is like being in a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but you don't go anywhere. So you're like, oh man, what am I going to do about that? Oh, no. Oh. Mm. Mm. Right? You're doing something. You're hagahing. And what you meditate on, you, what you meditate, when you meditate, you emulate. What you meditate on, you will emulate. And so if I don't watch what I'm worrying about, that's why the scriptures say, hey, whenever you recognize you got a worry, you got an anxiety, guess what? Flip it. Flip it into trusting God. Flip it into explore, discover. Okay, I'm exploring. What am I worrying on? Because sometimes you don't even know. Right? You're just kind of going, ah, oh, I just don't, I feel, I feel like there's dis-ease in my spirit. Dis-ease. I'm off. And I don't even know what it is. Well, that's going to require a little exploration, isn't it? Pausing, slowing down long enough to say, God, Reveal to me, God, the stuff that's stirring in my heart that I can't quite put my finger on. Because then once you discover it, then Scripture says, okay, now you've discovered it. Now I want you to submit it. I want you to, I want you to rely on me instead of lean on it. Lean on me when you're not strong. Lean on me. Right? God call, calls us into that space, and we start meditating on what God can do with that day and night, and all of a sudden, we're changed. All of a sudden, I'm not trying to control it anymore because 
That's not trust. That's not relying. I'm learning to surrender that. So the Haggah brings me to discovery, brings me to a leaning into God and lets me begin to surrender fully to His purposes and His plans in my life. Haggah. It's a beautiful way. It's the primary way I read the Bible. It's the primary way I read the Bible. Now, I, I, now you've heard me talk about my dyslexia. <laughs> you know what I have discovered? Dyslexia was my friend. There was no other way but slow reading. I couldn't read fast. I wasn't tempted to read fast. I labored over just putting the words together and the sentences together, but it turned out to be a blessing because it brought me to the Scriptures and slowed me down so I could chew on it. So borrow my dyslexia. Borrow it. Say, I need to slow down so I can break it into small, digestible pieces so it'll transform me. It's beautiful. It's my primary. This is the ideal. When Psalms 1 pops off with that, he's saying this is the ideal reader of Scripture, the one who meditates on it. It should be the top of your list. It should be your daily discipline. It should be your frame of reference. See how it make a difference? Let me give you another one. Uh, the second one is messianic literature. Messianic literature. So messianic literature is beautiful. Um, messianic literature, Messiah literature. So the Messiah is this person that the whole council of the Old Testament is pointing towards. They're saying, we need a savior. We need a, a rescuer. Literally, we need an anointed one. That's what uh, Mashiach means. It comes from the word um, um, Mesach, Meshach, which means to anoint with oil, to anoint, pour, or smear with oil. Anybody want to be anointed? <laughs> so I could smear you with oil? <laughs> um, so um, Aaron, Moses' brother, was the first one. Because Aaron, so right, some of you don't, you don't have context for this, trust me. <laughs> there was a guy named Moses, he had a brother named Aaron. <laughs> and Aaron was the priest. God says, Aaron's going to be the priest. He's going to represent me, represent the, the people to me. He's going to take the people's concerns and bring them to God. That's what a good priest does. Represents people, brings them to God. And God says, okay, I want you to anoint Meshach. I want you to Meshach Aaron. Smear a bunch of oil on him. Well, why would they do that? Because the oil represented the Spirit of God. It represented a special office, a needed assignment. Later on, the prophets were anointed, and later on, the kings were anointed. King Saul was anointed. King David was anointed. And so this idea of messianic literature comes out of that. So the oil is one of those ways. All the way through, all the way through the Old Testament, there's people being anointed with oil, and then all of a sudden, the anointed one that they're looking forward to, and all the prophets talk about looking forward to the anointed one. Who's the anointed one? What's he, what's he going to look like? He's going to ride on a donkey into Jerusalem. What's, the, what's this anointed one going to do? He's going to be the suffering servant. What's this anointed one going to do? He's going to carry the burdens and the sins of the people. What's this anointed one going to do? And all of a sudden, boom, Jesus pops up. And they say, could he be the Christ? You know what Christ is? It's Messiah in Greek. It's not a name. It's a title. Could he be the Messiah? The, the Mashiach? The one that's anointed to take the sins of the world? And so when you read your Bible and you read over and over and over again, not just about Jesus, but about Jesus Christ. They're saying, this Jesus man, remember the God-human-divine partnership? This man Jesus, the name his parents gave him, is the anointed one of God to take away the sins of the world. And it's woven all the way through the Scriptures. That's one of those. So another one is the seed, the seed uh, metaphor. So the seed metaphor shows up first in Genesis chapter um, 3, verse 15. You might remember the verse. It says that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. Remember, remember that? The seed of the woman, Eve, her seed, that means someone born from her line, would crush the serpent's head. 
There it is, first one, Genesis 3, one. that's really early, isn't it? And that idea of seed runs through. All of a sudden, we find out about Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis. And guess what God says to Abraham? Abraham, I will multiply your seed, and so that from your seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed. The seed, there it goes, the seed. It goes from Abraham all the way, then all of a sudden, David, King David comes on the seed. And guess what, this, guess what they say about David? As he's being anointed, that King David, this anointing is on you, God's appointed one. And through your seed, one king in your seed will reign forever. Well, that all automatically puts that, that seed, whoever that is, in a different category because no one lived forever unless... They're Jesus, who lives forever. See it? The messianic story being woven through the scriptures. Um, so I've got seed, I've got oil. What else was the other one? Oh, the blood. Ah, oh, the blood. Wow. Guess what happens in Genesis, right off the bat, whenever Adam and Eve are booted out of the garden because they didn't want to trust God? What happens? God killed an animal to give them cover. Right, they were naked. First, they were naked and not ashamed. Like, yeah, they're just running around in their birthday suit going, yeah, it's cool, it's free, it's free. And then all of a sudden, they seem like, ooh, ooh. All of a sudden, they're like, now they're naked and ashamed, right? Because all of a sudden, right, we, we didn't trust God. We didn't rely on Him. We relied on ourselves. And so now we're doing our own thing. And so God kills an animal and covers them. And that's what sacrifice does. It's the animal's death to cover our sin. And it runs all the way through the Scripture until John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you see it? Do you see it? Myth. So I'm reading the Bible how? Through a frame of reference because it's messianic literature. I'm reading it because it's meditative literature. I'm chewing on it. <laughs> breaking into little bite-sized pieces. And I'm reading it in this, this idea that whenever I'm reading I'm going, oh, I, I wonder where the Messiah, where, where, where's the Messiah? He's in there. Where's he at? He's in there. Where's he at? And the more I meditate, the more I go, oh, I didn't even know there was this seed thing. I didn't even know there was this blood thing. And that's just a few of the metaphors that run through the whole unified story that leads to Jesus. I'm reading it meditatively. I'm reading it because it's messianic literature. And I'm reading it because it is, number three, wisdom literature. It's wisdom literature. So now, just a little point of clarification. That when I talk about a variety of literary genres, okay, a variety of literary genres, that means the Bible's broken up into different kind of um, literary uh, work, um, narrative, Narrative is always about, you know, there's always a character in the narrative. There's a setting in the narrative. There's always kind of a plot like, oh, the bad guy's here, and the bad guy's been doing really bad stuff, but all of a sudden the good guy's going to come, and they're going to get them, and, and then it gets resolved. It's like, oh, that's a good narrative, right? Hollywood knows this, right? So all their stories follow the same narrative pattern, right? Why does, why does Hollywood, you can just, right, that's why I love Hallmark so much. I'm being facetious. <laughs> because their narrative plot is so standard and obvious, right? In the first three minutes, you can know, okay, that's the good guy, that's the bad guy, that's the pretty girl, that's the guy. Right? You just know it all, right? Boom. <laughs> but what do they know? Hallmark is like, like there's thousands and millions of people that watch Hallmark right? because they love the narrative. So the Bible's got a lot of narrative literature. And really, truly, so like I'm saying the Bible is all wisdom literature, the Bible is all narrative literature, but there's some that is specifically narrative. And so, so I say it's all in terms of the story is woven through, even the poetry, there's, the story's going through the poetry, but I read poetry different than I would read narrative. There's no, there's no plot to the poetry. There's rhyme, and there's parallelism, and there's contrast. I read the poetry different than I read the narrative. So there's all different kinds of narrative forms. So wisdom literature has a narrative form to it. So in the, right in the middle of your Bible, you've got Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. That's your poetic literature. It's written differently 
than the rest of the Bible. It's written differently. Now, there's poetry mixed into some of the other stuff, but those are po- that's poetry literature within the Bible. But, so let's look at the most classic poetry book. The most classic wisdom literature is the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs. Look at it with me. Verse 1 of Proverbs 1 says, now remember, just like, just like uh, Psalms, kicks it off and gives a feel for the whole thing, so does Proverbs. There are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. I love it. Their purpose, okay, why, why is he writing this? Their purpose is to teach people what? Wisdom, Wisdom and discipline. Hopefully those are not antithetical to your plan. Um, why? Why would I need wisdom and difficult wisdom and discipline? To help them understand the insights of the wise. Now, there's a difference between, between being a wise guy and having wisdom. <laughs> Don't be a wise guy. <laughs> but, but seek wisdom. And he says, I want you to seek wisdom. If you, if you read this, you're going you're gonna to get wisdom. So that's right out of wisdom literature, but let's tease it out. Let's look at a passage of scripture that's not wisdom literature, but tells us the Bible's purpose is to give us wisdom. Looky there. The same passage we started out with, 2 Timothy chapter 3, are you, are you tracking with me? This is the one we started. Remember, the, there's nothing like the written word of God for showing us the way to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Remember that one? Uh, you know, every part of the scripture is good, good for one thing or another. Are you with me? That one? The one that says, you know, it's good to show you the, show you the truth, to, to expose your rebellion, to, to, to correct your mistakes, to, to train you for, to live God's way. Remember that one? Same passage. Okay, same passage, just the previous verse. Look what the Apostle Paul says. He's writing Paul to Timothy. He says, that's the context. I'm thinking, who's writing? Paul, who's he writing to? Timothy, okay. Context. Okay, what's he going to tell? This is a a mentor writing to a mentee. What's he going to say? He says, from childhood, you have known the uh, sacred scriptures. This is the amplified version, so it gives a little more nuance of the text. The Hebrew scriptures, which are able to give you the the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Notice what he says, what it says, uh, surrendering, what? Read it with me, ready, set, go. Surrendering your entire self to him and having absolute confidence in what? His wisdom, power, and goodness. Are you, are you tracking with me? When you meditate on this, it gives you wisdom. You get smarter. Anybody need to be smarter? <laughs> Don't take my smart book. This is my smart book. Wow, I'm going to hold on to this and I'm going to think about it morning, noon, and night. Why? Because I want to be smart morning, noon, and night. That's why. I want a frame of reference that tells me how do I handle this kind of person? I want a frame of reference to go, what do I do when I'm stressed? I want a frame of reference that says, what do I do when I'm, you know, being a, just, you know, attacked by somebody? I want a frame of reference to know how not to be defensive. God says, oh, I, this bud's for, book's for you. <laughs> Ingest it. <laughs> Drink it up. Chew it up. And it'll change you. Jesus, trust him. Matthew 7, 24 says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like what? A wise man who built his house on a rock. You see, when you find out that, wow, I think I had the wrong frame of reference when I read the Bible. And so I'm going to start to approach this book with a frame of reference that says, the first thing I'm going to do with the Holy Bible, oh, it's upside down. Gets to get it right side up. (laughs) The first thing I'm going to do with the Holy Bible is ask the Holy God to use His Holy Spirit to help me hear His voice when I open His pages. And then I'm going to read it from a frame of reference that says, what was the historical context? What was the literary context? What was the setting context? 
And then I'm going to start breaking into smaller pieces. And I'm going to chew on one chapter, one paragraph, one sentence, and one word. So it doesn't stay out there. So it gets in here. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we are, we are all on a journey. And God, it's my, it's my ultimate desire that on this journey on today, a little snapshot of us today is that lights go on, epiphanies happen, illumination takes place. And across the room we say, ah, oh, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to I learn to chew on it. I want to read slowly, not fast. I want to read frequently, not intermittently. I want to let it open my day and close my day because I want to be smart. I want to know the author. I want to know the purposes of God. And Lord, you serve it up. You've served it up on a plate for me and my palate longs for it. But I have to train myself to consume it instead of something else. So I just, I, I leave that with you. I, want, uh, I leave with you the challenge to, to simply ask yourself in this moment, what are you busy consuming? Because I'll guarantee you, that's what you're under the influence of. And if you're under the influence of the wrong thing, I, it's not making you smart. It's making you selfish. And so you've got a choice. To stay under the influence of something that makes you selfish or to get under the influence of something that makes you selfless. To get away from something that's going to make you self-destruct and get under something that's going to make you constructive about yourself. And it's our choice. He served it up. Will you eat it up? Whisper with me just a little prayer. If, if today you're just you're saying, Pastor, I'm with you. I'm with you. I want a different frame of reference. Just whisper, dear Heavenly Father, I don't know how, but you have given this amazing book, this collection of books, and you've invited me to eat it, to chew on it, to digest it, to internalize it. Show me how. Teach me. Mold me and make me to be more like you. If you're here this morning and you've, maybe you've never, um, you've never asked God to come and live in your heart, you're, you feel a little bit, I mean, it's all been interesting, but you feel a little bit like you're on the outside looking in. I just want to invite you. I'm talking, if that describes you, I want to talk to you for just a moment. I want to invite you to, to whisper a prayer that will take you from the outside and bring you to the inside. It'll bring God from a concept into a relationship. If there's a stirring in your heart to do that right now, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Awesome. Hands up are all over. Whisper with me. Jesus, I need you. I confess my selfishness, my preoccupation with my agenda. I confess that I'm lost and I want to be found. I want to have relationship with you, Lord. Please fill my heart with your presence and your forgiveness. As much as I know how, I accept your sacrifice for sins, for my sin. I invite you to take up residence inside of me. Help me, Lord, to now stay dedicated and focused on this new relationship. In Jesus' name.